They say one of the biggest challenges is to get a crowd quiet after tea break or lunch break. And this is quite evident of that. Um, it's always good to hear noise in the venue. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Dolph Ordon from the University of Pretoria. When JP mentioned the discussions previously and the 20 year experience, uh, we both involved in technology and higher education for more than 20 years. The only difference between the two of us, I've got gray hair, he's got none. So I think it has to do maybe the level of challenges. And from that perspective, I think our specific um, the focus of this specific panel discussion or presentations are quite applicable. And I've got two colleagues with me during the next few minutes, um, Tiana van Amaro from the University of Free State and Dr. Gerrit Wissen from University of Witwatersrand will join us on, on Skype in a few minutes. We decided to do it as follows. We will follow a procedure of where we have the two presenters uh, do the presentations and then allow us for internal discussions and questions to both of them, but just purely open discussions. So without further ado, I want to welcome Tiana. Um, we know, and we just joke about it, we know that she will finish her presentation in 20 minutes. And there's a reason, and I'm not going to tell you what the reason is, but maybe she can do it personally if she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, we're looking forward to your applicable presentation. Thank you, Tiana. Thanks, Dolph. Um, I didn't expect such a big crowd, uh, <laughs> given the presentation yesterday. So I think um, I can relate now to some of the academics at our, or at our institution that walk into classes where they expect to see 20 students and suddenly, because of over-enrollment, um, there are more. <laughs> so um, first, let me just get a feel for the audience. Who is academic staff member? Okay. Great stuff. <laughs> Academic support. Uh, okay, so we're a 50 50 split. So. Maybe administrators. <laughs> <laughs> no. And then is there anyone from management or leadership structures in the audience? Oh, one or two yeah. hands. Okay. Um, so I decided when the call came out for papers to present, uh, we're in the middle of quite a huge project, which I will talk to you about in a few minutes. But one of the things that we realized during this project is the human element in terms of teaching and learning, and more specifically, teaching with technology. <laughs> um, teaching with technology has become a given. So. For us, we're not talking as a separate entity anymore, but as how is it really an integral part of what academics do. So I presume Gerak is going to talk more from a learner perspective. My focus will be more from an academic support perspective, focusing on academic stuff and the role that human relationship with academics play in terms of the way forward. So, thinking about us as humans, we need to look at history. History is such an important part of, of what we do. So, at the University of the Free State, uh, we were very privileged to have an external review at our Center for Teaching and Learning at the end of last year. So, we had to do some of this background for that external review. Um, our e-learning division was established only in 2006, so we're only in the game for about 12 years. At that stage, we were part of the Center for Higher Education Studies and Development, which was an academic support department. And in that support department, we had a separate entity with graphic services. So some of these studies who started in 1980 is still part of the team, and they actually started a few years before that. And we're very privileged to have them in our team. But in 2012, we merged into a center for teaching and learning, and we got a, a new name, uh, Curriculum Delivery and Innovation. And <clears throat> So for us, that was quite a big step going forward, getting the stigmas away from just being an add-on to teaching and learning to really becoming an integral part 
of what academics were supposed to do. And we're now even more privileged to be housed within our central library or main library on campus that are being repositioned as a learning hub for students. Um, it took us uh, quite a time to get to this very complex structure of 28 permanent staff members and 38 contract staff members who just work in curriculum delivery and innovation um, in the center where quite a huge center per se. But I can say I was the first postgraduate research assistant that worked, started working in e-learning in 2006. And my job at that time too was to do basic learning analytics. I had to do the data of how many students uh, downloaded specific activities and took part. That was my first job. Um, um, so currently we have design teams uh, that work in the faculties. So we've got one designer uh, that's allocated per faculty. Uh, they do sit in our centre, but spend most of their time with academic staff. Um, and then we also, in the design teams, have a learning developer uh, that uh, assists the learning designer in their roles and responsibilities. In a few years ago, three, four years ago, we expanded the structure to include an assessment team because we realised the importance of assessment and online assessment. So we um, established an assessment team of which Anari is heading up that presented yesterday. And in the past year, we also included a very strong research component to what we do in the unit. Um, so we've got the four tracks, the, the learning technology, the learning graphic and multimedia design, the assessment and research, and then finally the student training and development. And, so the poor student training and development, they're quite exhausted because for the first three months of this year, they were just busy with student training, student support, and making sure everyone had access to what they're doing. So in terms of our relationship with academics, our learning designers and assessment team are working on the coal phase with academics. <clears throat> and then at, um, in last year, I was tasked uh, in the centre by our top management to start with a review of our new generation teaching and learning environment. <laughs> and, and if you're um, well aware, EDUCOURSE um, it has a high profile project in terms of the next generation teaching and learning environment. So this relates strongly to what we're doing. And what we are trying to do is to merge the academic teaching environment and the student learning environment and, and see how we can use technology to bridge some of those <laughs> challenges that we have in terms of collaborating the two entities with one another. And you'll see, sorry, the, the uh, font isn't that big, but we are using quite extensive research methodology to get the data that we need. We are working in focus groups in faculties to understand student voices, but very importantly, academics feel that for a long time the academic voice was ignored in terms of teaching and learning. So we're trying to give academics uh, their voice back by also giving academics the opportunity to discuss on how they want to take teaching and learning forward. And then in 2017, um, we had a lot of quantitative data that we've collected through digital identity studies that Anari and Yoni spoke about. Uh, we were involved with a, in a DHET collaborative project with UJ and a few other universities around personal mobile devices where we got a lot of data from students. And then we are also very privileged to be part of a Carnegie project with some other universities as well around the impact of edu uh, or student protest and the use that student protest had on the use of educational technology at various institutions. So what you'll see today is some of the themes and uh, two or three slides on quantitative data that came out of some of these um, various interventions, but um, it is a very complex and a very difficult presentation to do. And as uh, JP said yesterday, very messy as well, and you'll see why. <clears throat> 
So one of the things that my team does is they do a module analysis to see to what extent are um, academics making use of the system. When I started in two, 2006, there was a full eight modules making use of WebCT <laughs> at that stage. <laughs> okay. Um, we have grown to about just under 3,000 modules per year that make use of the LMS. <clears throat> so when we looked at the 2017 data in terms of the first semester data, uh, and this was now just after the student protest, we saw that and uh, year modules and second semester modules are excluded from, from this data. Uh, that um, although 68% of all our modules and 71% specifically of undergraduate modules make use of the LMS, uh, there was still a huge percentage not making use. And that what, what was more worrying for us was looking at adoption within specific faculties to see a large decrease. Yes. So poor Anneri, working with this data, came into my office first she had a lot of swear words to say that there are something wrong with the data because this cannot be true. And she went back to the data two or three times to see what is actually happening. And you'll see in some faculties there are an increase, but in some faculties there is a massive decrease in terms of adoption. And then we tried to understand but what's going on and we started to delve into the data. So in terms of digital identity data, we saw, okay, maybe one of the problems was that academics cannot see the value of the technology in their teaching and learning. Maybe that's the problem. And when we looked at this item in the questionnaire, you'll see that the majority of our academics actually can see the value and can believe that technology can help them to be more effective. But why aren't they using it? And when we ask them, what are your perceptions around students, they also believe that students', can, uh, students learning can be enhanced more with technology. So it still didn't answer why necessarily they are not making use of the technology. <clears throat> and then this for me is probably what we're aiming towards. I think for a long time, teaching and learning has been seen as separate entities. And we have focus, and I think Harrod is going to focus a lot on that, on the student learning. How can we actually increase student learning? What do students want us to do? How should we focus our learning design on learning? But for a long time, the academic perspective was lost and the academic voice in terms of teaching. And the challenge is to get the two to get to move closer to one another. And the bigger the overlap, the better the quality of the teaching and learning. So we went and, and we looked at some of our famous characters. And that's why I ask who's academic staff and who is academic support staff. Because you all can relate uh, to somebody in here. <laughs> the one I get to deal most with is Mr. Anger. <laughs> okay? They're usually the one shouting over the phone because the LMS is down. <laughs> okay? The joy is usually our new academic staff. They're so eager to try everything out. <laughs> okay? And at every workshop, they're there. <laughs> okay? Sadness, that's usually um, our older academic staff members that will tell me, in the good old days, <laughs> and it's if they, if they get uh, that moment, uh, fear, those are usually the guys that, that are just too scared to, to try it out. And, oh, the research professors and their disgust <laughs> when they talk to us and, oh, this teaching and learning thing. <laughs> so I think we can all relate to a figure here. And even in, in the support services, um, we see some of them. <laughs> oh, yes, and I can relate to some of my colleagues in the support services. So we, we looked at the, some of the technology <coughs> adoption models that, that there is, and one that it's re very relevant in our case is the Ishakwa diagram towards some of the barriers in terms of faculty adoption. 
And we looked at this and we had a, a very long discussion in the team about how this relates to what we're doing. And when we looked at the data as well that we got from some of the focus groups and interviews, one of the things that we realized that was missing was the heart, the relationships, the human element. And how do we bring that together? And how do we refire or relit that fire? So when we look at the academic, we can see at our institution one of the key relationships that's broken with academic staff members is between academic staff members and students. Okay? And we'll talk about some of the reasons for that in a while. But uh, just before the presentation, one of the other presenters had a discussion with Dolph about academics need to learn how to trust their students. And trust that they're capable to do things, trust that they actually can learn independently, <laughs> and vice versa as well. So the question I pose to you today, because I don't have the answers to this, is how do we repair that key relationship in teaching and learning, if that is broken. And then, especially like in a faculty, like the Faculty of Health Sciences, the relationship with external role players, like the government, in terms of dual appointments, is very problematic and is very politically charged at this stage. And academics have reached a point where they said, enough is enough. We will do just what is expected of us. <clears throat> and then, as well, the relationship with support services, and that I will look at in the end. So some of the factors that have impacted and that came out of the data is that impacted on these relationships is firstly the business model of higher education. And performance management, workload models, research incentives, third stream income hasn't become something strange in higher education. And more and more academics are pushed towards the research side of things because the incentive is there here to perform. Uh, to perform. The second is the student protest. Um, we didn't realize how emotionally charged the impact and what is the, the consequences of the student protest will be here on our academic staff as well as on our students staying behind. Um, we were forced, or some faculties were forced to go completely online during the student protest. And despite experiencing the positive uh, um, consequences of that and surviving the academic year, still the next year they decided they're not going to use it because they felt their voice wasn't heard. Student numbers, um, with student protests came the December last year where free higher education was announced. And at our institution, we have had over-enrollment this year of, in some cases, uh, faculties. So in one faculty, we have an academic staff member that needs to present the same class eight times. Um, um, if you have three periods per week, that means three days you're just doing teaching. Then you haven't got to academic development. You haven't gotten to any other work that uh, your performance plan is based on. And given the discussion yesterday about MOOCs, online learning, and the expectation there is for academics to also get involved with these initiatives, the question is to what extent can the increase in student numbers without more resources impact on academics? Very uh, Related to this is infrastructure and support. <laughs> okay. Our classrooms cannot be built, uh, be built quickly enough. Um, and looking at some of the data we're getting as well, is students, although they prefer a blended approach, they also like the face-to-face. -face, and we cannot remove the face-to-face -face component <laughs> from our students. And that also raises a lot of questions in terms of online learning and going forward is 
How do we create those face-to-face -face environments? If I can go back to the example of the teacher that need to teach eight at the same period eight times, an easy technology solution would be just record the lecture and make it available to students. But our students demand that they've paid to see the lecture face-to-face -face and not a recording. <laughs> so what we're seeing is just this change fatigue with our academics. Uh, um, and I, I know we, we can be maybe in exclusion. Uh, other academics don't feel it. But in terms of the discussion we had with some other national institutions, they're also experiencing the same. And the question is how to mitigate this and how to get academics to feel appreciated and feel that they are um, actually making a difference. So we're at the tipping point. And the question I want to leave you with is, what does it mean for centers for teaching and learning? What does it mean for the leadership of universities? And what does it mean in terms of our academic developers and our learning designers that work on the cold face with academics and need to engage with them and get them excited about doing innovative things in, in terms of teaching and learning? So um, this we have designed a few years ago uh, at our institution to explain to academics what a learning designer is supposed to do. But we're at the stage where we need to revisit this and say, but a, a lot of the work that learning designers and academic developers are doing is therapy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and... Um, how do, we, how do we capacitate our learning designers for that? Because otherwise what we're seeing is also that the change fatigue is setting in with people doing wonderful work in these centres and in faculty. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.